Howdy guys! Today I'm going to go through the art of Mass Effect 3. I'm going to give my thoughts on the Mass Effect trilogy now that I'm done being depressed over finishing my first playthrough. So, uh, spoiler warning! Um, so I haven't really looked through the art book yet or uh, really prepared what to say, so forgive my rambling. Alright, our first picture is Reapers, Reapers galore. There's absolutely no denying what Mass Effect 3 is all about, and it's all about stopping the Reapers from ruining everything. Alright, we got this again, and the credits for anyone interested. Alright, so we've got, I guess you could assume that this is Shepard looking over a ruined planet. You know, that's the thing with Mass Effect 3. It starts off with Reapers and everything going crazy. It is an adrenaline rush right at the beginning. Which is cool because you know what your goal is. It's to get the Reapers to stop ruining everything. You know, it's, it's cool on the one hand to have this enemy that you've had for a couple of games being at the forefront of it all and you know that your goal is going to be to get rid of them. And as games go, you fully expect to destroy the Reapers. You know, the only like problem I feel like there is with the opening of Mass Effect 3 compared to, say, the original Mass Effect is that you don't quite get that sense of wonder that there's going to be something bigger. You know, when you first step into the original Mass Effect game, you know, you're on a mission and you go down to the planet, you lose a man right off the start, right at the start, you know, Mass Effect uh, very much deals with death a lot, and they make that very obvious within the first few minutes of playing. Now, as Mass Effect goes on, you know, your goal is to chase Saren, but, you know, a good halfway through the game, you finally find out more about these Reapers, and, you know, that, that light clicks on when you realize, oh, this game's a lot more massive than I realized. You don't quite get that, oh my, there's something bigger out there feel from Mass Effect 3. You've, you're just working toward a goal the whole time. At least that's what I think. Alright, allies. Ashley Williams. Ashley, Kaiden, and Liara were meant to be love interests throughout all three parts of the trilogy. After taking them away from players in Mass Effect 2, they were ready, to, ready for a passionate return in Mass Effect 3. For Ashley's reappearance in the series, we let her hair down and gave her sex appeal, while keeping her in a uniform that introduced the new Alliance colors. Ashley first bumps into Shepard as an Alliance officer on Earth, so her iconic look is a stylish officer's uniform, but later she will don a full set of armor. Okay, so both uh, Ashley and my Shepard let their hair down for the big war. And I'm not really sure if you should keep let your hair down when you're fighting Reapers, but you know, I can't complain, I did literally the same thing. So, Ashley, 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 you know, I, I don't know what to really think about her. You know, you, you see that she's got a real attachment to her family, and she comes from like a military family, so she's really all about getting the job done. And, um, you know, I don't regret uh, saving her back in Mass Effect 1. I think that uh, the dynamic between her and my, and my Shepard was, was kind of interesting. It really was. But um, I feel like my Shepard and Ashley could just never really see eye to eye or really be... F I feel like to some extent Ashley never forgave uh, Shepard for affiliating with Cerberus. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on that, but eh, it's just how I feel. 
Alright, Kaiden's armor in the original Mass Effect was hardly memorable. <laughs> to be honest, him as a whole was hardly memorable. We wanted to change that. The team bulked him up to show that he's seen a lot of action and is ready to fight in the biggest war the galaxy has ever seen. The armor went through many slight changes as we figured out the alliance colors for human male characters. We used Kaiden's head from the first Mass Effect, but since the design was more than six years old, we updated his look for Mass Effect 3. Poor, poor Kaiden. You know, I don't really have much of an opinion on him. You know, my first playthrough of Mass Effect, I uh, didn't really talk to my squad a whole, whole lot until like the end of the game. Whoops. So I don't really ever feel like I got to know Kaiden too well, and um... Like, the one time I did talk to him, he was like flirting with me or something. It's like, ho, ho, hold on. I don't even like, I'm not even quite sure how to say your last name and you're trying to get all cozy with me. Yeah, that's not for me. So, on Vermeer, I ended up saving the girl, Ashley, instead of Kaiden. So, I don't have much of an opinion on the guy. He might be nice. He might be a jerk. I don't really know. He seemed okay, but he was very absent for most of my game. So,. I can't really say much about him other than I guess I need to play do another playthrough with Kaiden instead of Ashley. Alright, James Vega. The idea for James Vega was to create a blue-collar military officer, a heavy-muscled tank of a man. We gave his armor more heft to imply that James is an unstoppable force. The team added a beard, scars, and tattoos to make him stand out from the other Alliance Marines, notably Ash and Kaiden, who are both very clean cut. You know, he's he was definitely a fun character. I really did like him, but I'm just, oh, I just don't really feel like he fits. It. I don't know. I feel like Shepard had made so many friends and made so many allies over the course of her adventures. It just, I don't know. I feel like I would have rather had someone from like Mass Effect 2 or, you know, I'd rather have had one of my old characters. Not that I dislike James. It's just like, man, I've already got so many friends. I guess, um, I guess they kept James in because for the people that maybe wanted new characters to play with. And there's nothing wrong with playing new characters at all. It's just, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I just didn't really use James um, enough except for like the N7 missions. He just seemed, um, you know, kind of shallow, I guess. And it's really hard to appreciate his character without watching, um, what was it, Paragon Lost? I think that was the little animation. I don't know, I just feel like maybe he didn't really get developed as much, or maybe it feels that way because you don't really do like the personal missions like you did in the second game, so I kind of felt like I didn't really know him, he was just there for the party, right? I don't know. Alright, my, my sweetheart here, Garrus Vakarian. We added silver to Garrus' signature blue and black armor to reflect his new rank. His eyepiece was slightly altered, and we added more detail to his armor. The idea was for Garrus to look familiar, but with heavier armor to withstand the battles he'd be facing in Mass Effect 3. Garrus, Garrus, Garrus. Really the only character to stand by Shepard beginning to end for... I mean, I feel like of all the side characters you get... Or not side characters, squad mates. He's there for the majority of the time, so, you know, just the familiarity that Shepard feels with him, I feel like she can't help, oh, well, a female Shepard, obviously, or, or a male Shepard, I mean, whatever, but I, I think Garrus is only into the ladies, but, um, <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, I feel like it's only natural to develop a romance with him just because he's always there. I really liked, uh, Garrus' character as a whole. He's, uh, really hard not to give along with or to dislike like if anyone actively dislikes Garrus I would honestly like to know why I mean he he's the kind of person I feel like he can see things from both perspectives and he's pretty chill about everything you know he cares about what's important and um 
gosh, I, I don't know how he's doing now that Shepard is no longer with him. I, I in, in, my, in my fantasy world of Mass Effect, he, he ends up hooking up with Tally and they, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I like Garrus because, um, you know, when you first start uh, Mass Effect and you step into the world, you know, the very first game, you know, Turians are the first, like, some of the first aliens you interact with, and, you know, Saren is a Turian, and a lot of the Turians kind of treat Shepard poorly, and, you know, with, with good reason, you know, maybe there's Turians still bitter about the first contact war. Fair enough, understandable enough, and I remember playing through the first Mass Effect, and I just, oh, I don't like these Turians, they're all jerks. Well, Garrus is there to change how I feel about Turians, because you realize that Turians aren't so bad, and I think Garrus is, he, he's that person that makes you realize, okay, in Mass Effect you've got to treat people on an individual basis. There's crappy Turians, and there's good Turians. There's crappy humans, and there's good humans, and that applies to everything. There's good Asari, crappy Asari. Good Salarians, crappy Salarians. You've got to treat people on an individual basis. And if you want to take it a step further, there really are no good or bad people. It's just people that sometimes make bad decisions, right? But yeah, I I love Garrus. I I don't know. I feel like some of his ability, like as far as like a fight, like a squad mate, a fighter, some of his abilities seemed a little disjointed. Maybe that's just me. I kind of, I felt like he didn't really have a well-defined role in combat. He was just kind of there doing his own thing. That might just be me and me sucking at combat though, but Garrus is the, the bro. I love him. I'm gonna miss him more than anyone else, I think. Alright, Liara to Sony. Fans are most familiar with Liara wearing her medical outfit from the first Mass Effect, but we instead chose the outfit she wore in Lair of the Shadow Broker downloadable content for Mass Effect 2. The jacket is a reminder of her background in science, and or while the more armor-like pieces get across that the galaxy is at war and even civilians must join in the fight. Oh, Liara, Liara, Liara. I'm really sad that she left for Mass Effect 2 and basically just became DLC. And uh, then she returned in Mass Effect 3. It, it seemed kind of weird. It seemed like, you know, with her being the shadow broker and having all these new responsibilities and, you know, really doing all sorts of stuff, it seems kind of strange that she would join Shepard for Mass Effect 3 instead of doing her own thing like a lot of the other characters did because she's a very driven character. You know, she has a lot of things that she's passionate about and that she's interested in, and she's very smart. She has so much going on, but yet she finds time for hanging out with Shepard. I, um, I, I really like Liara. She's sweet, see, she's sensitive, but, um, I don't know, you know, she never seems happy. I don't ever feel like there's really a whole lot of truly joyous moments with Liara. I feel like she stresses out about everything. I feel like, I really do feel like the weight of the world is on her shoulders. My only real problem with Liara was in the first game when you're like just starting to talk to her. Now this might have been my fault, but you know, when I just started to talk to her within like three paragraphs, she's like uh, trying to jump my bones and it's like, Liara, I only like you as a friend. Come on, calm down, girl. And, I mean, it just kind of made my every interaction with her feel a little awkward. And, you know, I don't know if Liara always secretly kind of has a crush on Shepard. Or if she's more... I feel like she's maybe more attracted to the idea of Shepard than maybe Shepard herself. I don't really know. But I feel like Liara is the kind of person with too much going on to really have time for a relationship anyway. I'm not sure about... I'm not sure what her romance must be like. I mean, obviously I'd have to play through her romance and see if she is a little bit different when you get to know her on a personal level, but I don't know, she seems like the kind of people that, or the kind of person that works 80 hours a week and also has a side job. I feel like she wouldn't have time for me, and Shepard was the one that's supposed to be busy. <laughs> 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that she's, I'm glad that she was available in Mass Effect 3, even if it didn't really feel like it fit necessarily. I don't know, just my thought. All right, my girl, Jack. We wanted to show Jack's maturation from Mass Effect 2 while still keeping her a rebel at heart. She's wearing more clothing, <laughs> barely, and has grown her hair out, but still looks like she's rejecting the system. At the time this concept was made, it was not clear that she would be a teacher at Chrism Academy, so her appearance looks a little unusual for a classroom, I'll say. Not that Jack would ever wear a regulation uniform. Hmm, I'm wondering if they were planning on making Jack like a squad mate and then they scrapped it or something because from the from the dialogue or the, not the dialogue the paragraph there it sounds like they wanted to include Jack but they didn't know in what capacity I feel like um I feel a little disappointed that she didn't come with me but her excuse seemed good she she found something she cared about you know she found some children that she wanted to teach biotic abilities to to have them harness it and you know um, with my ending I, uh, I had Jack send her students into the front line so she lost everything she cared about so you know I can't help but wonder what happens to Jack after the end of Mass Effect 3 is she back to being a rebel has she found something else to care about I mean the big thing that we learned from Jack is that Jack has a heart you know when she was completely psycho in the second game and she softened up by the third one right she found something to care about and in the party you even see her with the with the little dog so I think uh, Jack's definitely let go of some of her hatred and anger and she's got to be feeling pretty good about uh, you know Cerberus falling apart so you know now that she's not so consumed with hatred and revenge maybe the poor girl can finally finally live her life I still I really like Jack I just wish that she was I wish she could have been a character in Mass Effect 3 that you kept, but, you know, I understand why not. She's got her own things going on. I really like Jack, though. Alright, Edie. Ooh-wee. Edie's body needed to be sexy, chrome, and robotic. The Mass Effect version of Maria from Metropolis. We had a... I'm not sure what that is. We had a lot of discussion about how robotic she would appear, what her hair would look like, and whether or not her face would be expressive. Since the body is an infiltration unit that once had skin over the metal, we decided she would have the same facial effects as other humans. Otherwise, the unit would be easily spotted. <laughs> Alright, Edie the sex bot. Alright, so my problem with Edie is... I never trusted her. From beginning to end, I had such a hard time trusting her. I'm like, it's a Cerberus AI, no! You know, I just, I don't know, I never really accepted her for her, which, um, you know, I, I think isn't necessarily a bad thing. I feel like I just really, really got immersed in the Mass Effect universe, and you know, when you know, my shepherd sees all the crap that goes wrong with AIs and synthetic life. It just seems natural that my shepherd would be like, oh, ho, 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 ho. hold on a moment now, you know, and um, it gets really hard to dislike Edie, though, when she's so darn hot. <laughs> I, um, I don't know, I kind of wish they maybe developed Edie a little bit better though because I think Edie could have been a more interesting character if a lot more time was invested in her but to be fair Mass Effect 3 took me like 80 hours to complete as it is I don't think they could have added a whole lot else without making it like a 200 hour game but um you know I just you know Edie is kind of how do I describe it she she's like you kind of understand the growth of synthetic life through her. She goes from just, just being this AI that helps control the Normandy, and even at the end of Mass Effect 2, you can hear Edie talking about how the Normandy feels like a, a glove, I think, is, pro is how she describes it. You can first start seeing how she's trying to 
make her life compare like uh, uh, she's trying to explain the way she perceives life in a way that other life that organic life might understand so in Mass Effect 3 you kind of see that built upon where Edie goes from just you know machine helper artificial intelligence to really someone with her own personality she even cracks the jokes in the second one and they just get worse and worse and worse in the third one and you know for she's got a lot more personality than some characters do but um, I think it would have been interesting just to see you know, more more of, of uh, life through her eyes, the synthetic life versus actually living. And, um, you know, I don't want to talk about endings too much. I'm actually thinking I'm going to do a separate video just talking about endings. But um, apparently, like in the ending where you decide to destroy all synthetic life, you don't really see, you, you know that... Edie's synthetic life and she's going to pay the ultimate price for the destroy ending and you don't really see it though you know it's going to happen but you don't see it happen and I think seeing it happen would really drive home your choice and um, you know but I picked the synthetic ending for my first playthrough and, or synthesized ending and I feel well like I said I don't want to talk too much about it but I feel like Edie can live more as a person now, even even though if that's not necessarily a good thing. Like like I said, I'm not going to talk about the endings because there's a lot to talk about there. So I'm not going to I'm just going to stop there before I touch up on it too much. There's a lot of debate to be had over the ending, so saving that for a separate video altogether. But Edie, I'm sorry, I didn't trust you. <laughs> I didn't trust you all the way up to the ending. I, I briefly trusted her at the party, and then it, it, it all went away, and now I realize I was wrong. <laughs> sorry, Edie. Oh, <laughs> I guess just a little... I guess maybe that was a early concept of Edie there, next to Joker. She almost looks like an Asari or something with a uh, head fringe, but it looks like she's just connected. I think that would have been a pretty cool idea. She would have looked more machine-like, though, and less human-like. Oh my, the Prothean, he's not even given a name in this. We had numerous designs for the Prothean's armor. It needed to have an ancient feel, but still be fantastically high-tech. Eventually, we steered toward clothing more like a samurai's than the high-tech armor Shepard wears to suggest the wearer had been in stasis for more than 50,000 years. I'm not really sure how samurai armor suggests that he'd been in stasis, but okay. I like how they hadn't even given Javik a name. I'm not really sure why, they just call him the Prothean here. Gosh, so I guess that he went through a few different concepts, and you know, when you think about uh, the first Mass Effect, when you're talking about Protheans, you don't really know what Protheans look like. You never really find out, I think, until the third game. And um, yeah, it looks like they went through a few different designs trying to figure it out. Um, I don't know which one I, I mean, they just. I don't know. I, I kind of like them all. They they look pretty interesting. It was very exciting getting to see a Prothean, and I think it was really cool that Javik was kind of a, a troll, honestly, kind of a jerk, because it's um, it's easy to remember anybody. Not not just uh, not just in the Mass Effect world, but it's easy to romanticize a lot of things. You know, you think back to any period of the world. Oh, everyone was so enlightened then, or everyone was so kind, and oh, these must have been such a benevolent people. But you know, the big thing about Mass Effect is that it teaches you that people are people, no matter what, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are. People People are people, some of them suck, some of them don't suck quite as much, and some of them are pretty decent even, and um, I think Javik was a really cool example of that because, you know, you build up this idea of the Protheans in your head, oh, they must have been this benevolent, high-tech high race that, you know, created all of this, they were, they were really something special, and then you meet Javik and he's just like, you're all inferior life forms and I hate you all, <laughs> and it's like, Oh, wow, well, we revived the jerk one, didn't we? Can we get a nice, can we trade this in for a nicer model? 
<laughs> you know, so, um, but that goes, like I said, with anything. You might think of, oh, this king, good king, whatever, good queen, whoever. You might, Any person that you might think of from history that might have been great or really awesome or really amazing, you have to remember they were just people. They might have been a jerk or had their bad moments or, you know, people as a whole. There are crappy people and there's good people. Yeah, but so it was really cool to not only actually see a Prothean, but getting to interact with one and learn from them and seeing how they're different. My only real problem was that I feel like having a Prothean around would have been a massive deal. I don't feel like anyone made as big a deal about it as they probably should have. I, I mean, like, I, I feel like he would be getting a lot of stares everywhere he went, right? But um, he was a DLC character, so, and that's the problem with DLC is it often feels like it's just a band-aid on top of the game and not fully integrated with it, so there's a few places that don't quite make sense, but um, I think uh, it wasn't uh, Javik, the, the DLC for him, like one of the day one DLCs with his codes already, or the the code for him already in the files or something like that. I, I definitely understand that there's a little bit of bitterness toward Javik because of like the day one DLC and it is crappy. I feel like it was just lazy to not incorporate him more and maybe even give him a, 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 his own like background quest or mission or something to learn a little bit more about him and everything he's gone through. I wonder what he's doing now that you know, Mass Effect has finished. You know, you know, he's the only Prothean. I don't know if there's like a Jim Bob Prothean on some faraway planet that's been living off the grid that he can, you know, relate with. But, you know, even though the Reapers have been defeated and his vengeance, you know, he's seen to his vengeance, it's like, what now? You know, that's all I can think about him. What now? You know, is there anything even left? I mean, you see at the end, he starts kind of developing more of a feeling, of, more feelings. He starts caring a bit more about people instead of wanting to throw them all out of the airlock. <laughs> but it seems almost forced. It seems like he starts caring about people because it's the end of the game. I'm kind of disappointed he didn't keep that uncaringness all throughout, you know, or I just feel like Javik should have been explored a hell of a lot more or just not included at all but he like I said he does serve a very important role in showing you that you know you can't romanticize everything so he was important in some regards but definitely could have been expanded on some more Ooh, early concepts of different uh, Protheans. I guess they tried to figure out where they wanted to put the extra eyes on their head. I like the some of these middle ones where you've got like eyes on top of eyes. I kind of like the ones on the far right. I think I think those skull designs might have might have worked a little bit better. They almost look. Some of them look more human-like too. Y you know what? I you know. Okay, here I'm gonna bring my mouse on screen here. This one right here almost looks, and maybe to some extent this one. You know, when you think Martians or aliens with big heads and big eyes, it looks kind of like a play on the you know, standard Martian, but with like, you know, extra eyes and, you know, a different looking head. And, you know, like this one, this one looks downright human, except for the different skull. It, it's very interesting. I like seeing all these different concepts. What a cool job that must be. Oh, here we go. The child. One child would be the face of the people on earth whom Shepard could not save. Above are variations on the child's clothing which we wanted to feel appropriate for the far future, but not so unusual that they would seem out of place on a child today. Hmm. So, yeah, Shepard really seemed haunted by this child the whole, whole time, and, you know, I'm not really sure if that really fit too well, because, you know, my Shepard, um, she was ruthless, right? She sent people to their death and made some really hard choices that killed people. 
constantly and uh, Mass Effect 2 her choices directly caused the death of Morden so it seems like Shepard would be haunted by someone like Morden or something instead of rando child you know number 300 but um, I guess when they explain it here one child would be the face of the people on earth who she could not save I guess that's what it is she's basically haunted by these thousands millions of people that died and you know it's just you know at the end of the game when you're talking to the catalyst it takes on the image of this child right so it's like is is the child really the face of the people of earth or is it representative of something more because the whole time during Mass Effect Shepard is trying to find the catalyst uh, she's getting people to work together so that they can build the crucible and then she's looking for the catalyst so in her dreams she's chasing the child who happens to be the catalyst but when she's awake she's actually chasing the catalyst around the galaxy so I think this is where the indoctrination theory is pretty interesting because of the this child here that no one else seems to mention or talk about or notice and even Shepard doesn't really talk about it too much but yet Shepard's chasing this child constantly she's not chasing you know Morden who she sent to her death she's not sending you know she's not chasing after all the people on Torfin that she sent to her death you know she's not chasing or haunted by anyone else but this child and the child runs away in her dreams and she's chasing after him I think the child and the fact that you see the child as the catalyst is, you know, the pretty good proof of the indoctrination theory. And like I said, I'm not going to talk too much about the endings because that's going to be a separate video altogether because <laughs> I really want to talk about those. But the child is definitely interesting and like I said, opens up a lot of possibilities of thought. Let's move on. Oh, here we go, more of the child, and you can see, I guess those were his concepts, different outfits they were trying to try, and can't go wrong with a hoodie, sweater, some like cargo pant jeans, you know, looks like, looks like something a kid might wear today, a little unusual, but not too much. All right, Kai Ling, and he went through quite a few variations too. Kai Ling, Cerberus's top assassin, was featured in the Mass Effect novels. Mass Effect 3 marks the first time he appears in a game. Early concepts gave him metal legs and hard armor, but this evolved into a stealthier appearance with a coat reminiscent of Thane's. His face and body kept a few obvious cybernetic implants to imply that he had been modified since the events of the books to become even deadlier. I have not read the novels. <laughs> so this guy came out of left field for me, like who the heck, even as far as this, he was like, who's this guy? Oh yeah. You know, for a really big bad guy, you know, I feel like he should have been more integrated and more talked about. You shouldn't necessarily need companion media for a big bad guy. I'd, I'd understand for like a side character like Vega even. James Vega had his own little movie to kind of explain him. And you know, you can play the game just fine without knowing more about Vega. It's just like, oh, okay, cool, big muscly guy. But Kai Ling, he kills Thane. Well, he doesn't quite kill Thane, but he's you know definitely part of the cause he basically more or less killed Thane he screwed up all of my plans with the catalyst you know he's been a, he was a thorn in my side and a pretty big thorn and he came out of nowhere from someone that just played the trilogy so you know I just you know it's my own fault for not reading the novels I should definitely read the novels and I'm going to but I just wish that in game Kyling had been explored a little bit more. Now it's kind of interesting that he's got all these cybernetic implants. It's like he was trying to be a second Shepherd, you know, with all of Shepherd's Cerberus, you know, Cerberus um, cybernetic implants. But he's just 
you know, he's more loyal than Shepard was, and maybe that that's his fault, is that he doesn't, you know, do what he feels is right, he just follows, and, you know, he, he could never be Shepard, even with all of his strength and ability, he didn't have a mind of his own, he was just a foot soldier in the end. A lot of interesting concepts for him. I kind of like this one. He, he ended up really, really quite freaky looking though, didn't he? Oh yeah, here, here he is. Com yeah, compared to what he could have looked like, you could see his eyes a little bit better. Yeah, I think, uh, hmm, maybe one, even one of the, I don't know, his, his last model was pretty crazy looking though. All right, Cerberus the elusive man, holy moly. One of the plans on the drawing board was to have the elusive man turn into a reaper creature for the final battle. Eventually this plan was scrapped since we wanted to give players the satisfaction of fighting a character they know rather than a random creature. The design implies that the elusive man's weapon is his intelligence, not his physical strength. I don't know, I think that would have been pretty cool. Look how badly mutated he is. It doesn't even really look like him at all anymore. It looks like somewhere between a, a reaper, a human, and an atlas, honestly. Holy moly! It's, you know, I, I bet it's a real joy to work in game development and see how much everything evolves. This is really, really fun freaky looking oh my gosh i guess there really wasn't much of a final battle though it's you know pretty insane at the end when you're fighting all these crazy reapers but you don't have to fight like a giant reaper baby or <laughs> human baby or anything your final battle is really almost a battle of wits with the guy isn't it Ooh, I like that. I'm, that is really creepy, the way his eyes look. Oh, so sinister, halfway through his transformation. Oh, okay, so I wonder how long it takes just to do little artwork, uh, little bits of artwork like this. So, so cool. Very neat. Okay, we got some more. Is this supposed to be like the final battle or something? There's just shadows and explosions. All right, sir. Oh, there's Cerberus. Tr mm, uh, no, I think. Okay, I think these people are just fighting Cerberus. He oh yeah. Oh yeah. These these look like Cerberus's um, robots. And okay, okay. So it's Cerberus. Alright, Cerberus Troopers. The Trooper is the most common Cerberus enemy in the game. We decided the armor needed to look more robust than it did in previous games to show that Troopers are battle-hardened foes who have fought all kinds of enemies across the galaxy. Common features for all Cerberus enemies were the coloring, rectangular eye slits, and circles over the shoulder and chest. Heavy armor pads over the collarbone completed the tougher look. I really liked the uh, sleek looking armor like this, and I'm really glad that <laughs> my shepherd ended up wearing some of it. It's really good armor, it really is. This is a cool looking helmet right there, very interesting. Yeah, you could definitely identify the Cerberus troops by their bright yellow design. No mistaking a Cerberus troop. Alright, the Engineers. The Engineer has lighter weapons and armor than the Trooper. The class is also capable of detaching a turret from their back and setting it on the field to help cover an area. We used cloth to imply that this class might be easier to bring down than a Trooper. Oh boy, this look also suggests they'll use technology and engineering to defeat foes rather than brute force. Alright, so, the engineers were definitely a pain in the butt with those turrets. I don't, I don't, I feel like I would have died a lot more if my uh, shepherd hadn't been an engineer. Being able to hack their own turrets and use it against them was a real, real joy and made me really happy I picked an engineer for my first playthrough. I think I would have really struggled if I picked anything else. You know, my problem with the, oh, here we go, more of them. 
All right, I'll, I'll talk more about the Cerberus troops when I'm done looking through them. I like this one, the sniper, so crazy looking. While early versions of the sniper were male, we ultimately decided to make her female to make the sniper's silhouette distinct from other Cerberus enemies, and it is. The red lens light was added so she would stand out at a distance. So if you can't find who's shooting you in the head, it's, it's one of these guys. All right, the Centurions, Centurions, whatever. Rougher versions of the Centurion were influenced by the uniforms of real life bomb disposal troops. Oh, that's cool. This was eventually toned down to fit the Centurion's leadership role. As the gameplay develop er, department created weapons for this class, we altered the armor to accommodate things like grenade canisters, matching form with function. Oh. Oh, that's really cool that it was um, influenced by real uniforms and things, or uh, outfits and things. And of course, my favorite thing to hack, the Atlas. The Atlas went through multiple iterations. An early version cast the Atlas as a heavy Mass Effect 2 Ymir mech with a soldier inside. Eventually a canopy was added to protect the soldier and uh, we made the Atlas larger than the Ymir. Oh man, another good old Cerberus and their technology and Engineer Shepard using that technology against them. I loved hacking these things and watching them go bananas on Cerberus. And of course, riding around in them was slow but fun. Alright, so I'm going to talk about the Cerberus troops for a second. So, my real, like, it was fun fighting Cerberus, especially um, when you know, like, what how you want to deal with them, like the Atlas and the um, Engineers. It was really fun to play an Engineer and use their weapons against them, but with these, like, Centurions, they could be a real pain in the butt with the, the shield, so having a Biotic lift them off the ground and knock that shield away was really essential. So it became really fun to fight Cerberus because you, I actually felt like I had got, I knew what their weaknesses were and I knew when to apply what strategies to them. And I don't know, it was fun to fight them, but at the same time, it almost seemed like a Saturday morning cartoon. It, it just seemed like Cerberus was the, you know, the 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 coyote that never gives up. You know, like uh, what is it, the the coyote and the Roadrunner? I don't remember, but um. You know, the Cerberus never gave up. They got their to their little silly Acme toys, and they come after you relentlessly the whole game. Like, where, I mean, the, these people were obviously indoctrinated because they're, they're just too dumb to keep coming at you otherwise. <laughs> you know, it, it's sad because, you know, you see what happens on Sanctuary, and you know what's happening to these people. They're... Not really, I mean, it sucks, but they have, you have to fight them. You know, these aren't, these were people that were modified probably against their will, and they're unfortunately your enemy. And it feels a little weird to be fighting other humans all the time when the Reapers are breathing down our necks, but, um,. I think it's important, I think the important takeaway from fighting Cerberus while the Reapers are going nuts is that that's a lot like real life. You know, so often do we have like this big, scary problem right in front of us and we're too worried about everything else going on, you know? There's so many things going on in the world and people are concerned with like something else minor, right? And not, not to say that you know that's not real. You know not to say that what Cerberus was doing is minor or anything like that. It's just, you know, I'm just saying that they insisted on fighting and being difficult, and <laughs> you know while all of this is going on, you know the only like real unfortunate thing, which I think it would have been way too ridiculous to actually implement, is it's too bad that Shepard just couldn't realign herself with Cerberus and be like, all right, sure, controlling Reaper sounds good. I don't want to fight him anyway. Hey, let's go with the elusive man and you and your Cerberus, maybe you can uh, align yourself with Cerberus and you're fighting the Alliance instead. 
<laughs> that would be a pretty scummy thing, though, so... But, you know, it's just weird because, you know, in the second Mass Effect, I feel really loyal to Cerberus. It's like, oh, these guys aren't so bad. They really helped me out. They rebuilt me. I was dead. I like them. I even handed over the collector base as a, as a thank you. <laughs> so it was really, like, it was really crazy in Mass Effect 3 to be like, he did what? And I'm doing what now with with Cerberus? Oh, man. And you find, well, you know, I don't think any Shepherd really could align themselves with Cerberus, considering all the horrible things that they did. Even in the in the second game, Jack keeps trying to tell you, Cerberus sucks, they did all this. And, you know, I'm sitting here, well, you know, Cerberus and is in different sets. Maybe not all of them are so bad. I was really, really determined to convince myself that all of Cerberus wasn't bad. And, well, they were. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they fall at the end as the bad guy always does. It just still feels a little silly to be constantly duking it out with Cerberus when there's Reapers all over the place. Alright, now the Reapers. The Banshee is a Reaper version of an Asari matriarch. She is stretched taller by the conversion process to make her silhouette both wispy and intimidating. So, not just any Asari, but Asari matriarchs. And look at the, like, I like this model because it looks so much like an actual, you know, Asari, but still being a Reaper. But man, they really like, uh, does, is the next one, oh nope, I was wondering if the next one was the in-game model because they really ended up so freaky, like fighting the first one of those, I mean, still, like, fighting all of them just was nightmare fuel, something about them, I think maybe it is the fact that they're so delicate looking just was so terrifying. It's really, 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 really terrifying, honestly. I never really looked forward to fighting those, and yeah, they, they were just pretty much pure nightmare fuel. I'm glad that there was only a few of them and not a ton of them running around. Pretty sad that this is the fate of a matriarch, someone that lived almost a thousand years just to become one of those. It's a friggin' shame. Alright, the cannibal. The cannibal is a reaper version of a Batarian with a human corpse for an arm. Oh! I never realized that! That's what that is. You can see the face right there, and the body of the human is twisted around like that. I never... Like, I, I realized that there's like another face in it, but I didn't know that's what it was. Oh my gosh! The corpse's legs fuse with a large gun. This seemed appropriate story-wise as the Reaper's early fronts during the invasion were in Batarian and human space. Oh man, and then you have to remember at the end of Mass Effect 2 when I blew up the mass relay, there's not really a whole lot of Batarians left in the whole galaxy and the ones that are left were twisted into this. Holy moly. You know, as much as I talk about, okay, you've got to treat, you know, people on a case-to-case -case basis, like, you know, just like with the Turians, I thought they were all jerks till I met Garrus and then found out a few of them weren't so bad. I never seen a good Batarian that weren't a dead Batarian. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Most of the Batarians were pretty big jerks, but um, with good reason. It's uh, definitely really freaky realizing that that was a human, though. Holy moly. I'm going to get off of this one. <laughs> oh boy. Brutes. The brute was an o or was named to suggest its appearance, a large enemy with an oversized claw, able to pick up and to mash Shepard into the ground. The Krogan were a perfect species to use as a model. We decided to swap out the Krogan head for something Turian, making it for a grisly synthesis of two species whose planets were closely linked in the invasion plan. The exposed vital organs were appropriately repulsive, but we ultimately added armor plating that could be blown off, making the brute extremely tough. 
Oh yeah, seeing these always made me S key away really, really, really fast. But by the end of the game, especially with like the up fully upgraded incinerate there, they they become pretty tame, honestly. Um, they're 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 ju they're just big targets to shoot. I'm still more scared of a banshee than these things. Am I? I don't know. <laughs> now here's the one I really hated: the Rachni. To kill or spare the Rachni Queen was one of the player's biggest decisions in the first Mass Effect, and we knew early on we wanted to bring the species back. Early versions had a human corpse turned into a gun mounted on the creature. When this was deemed too disgusting, we added large sacks that could be punctured, releasing miniature rachni. Oh, lovely. We're not sure if this is actually more palatable, but it made for more interesting gameplay. I hated these things. They were the absolute worst. I don't miss having to fight those at all. Yeah, look at, especially, look at this one. Oh, it's so freaky looking. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, the Rachni were really an interesting. I, I, I was really surprised that my, um, my decision influenced the game so much because the Rachni thing seemed, I mean, almost. I don't want to say minor because the, it, it really wasn't. But it, it just didn't feel like it was going to have such a long-lasting impact. It was definitely really nice to have the Rachni queen on my side and um, you know it's really cool because the Rachni you know they could communicate you know through I mean they were really really interesting they could communicate through cor corpses and the way they used language was really strange like you know they always talk about a, a song and stuff like that you know they were just a super duper interesting really really cool race and I almost wish that they could have been explored just a little bit more but you know like I said it took me uh, almost 80 hours or actually more than 80 hours to finish my first playthrough so <laughs> not really like they could have explored uh, the Rachni anymore and I mean they did a pretty good job of talking about them and stuff but I don't know there's so much cool stuff about the Mass Effect world all right, the Destroyer. For the third game, we decided to make a smaller version of a Reaper that could land on planets and actually do battle with Shepard. <sighs> it may not look it, but this Destroyer is only about 160 meters high in the game compared to two kilometers for Sovereign. <sighs> The original shape for Sovereign was based on a leaf insect nymph, which gives these reapers their distinctive silhouette. Oh, what an interesting concept. Oh, a leaf insect nymph. My god, that's oddly specific, too. Well, what can I say about the reapers? Th these were not fun to fight, were they? But uh, I, I, I definitely really like them. Like, honestly, all of the Reaper designs were really top-notch, especially after looking through the art book and seeing all the different versions they went through. You know, as, as far as making an interesting-looking, you know, bad guy, they, they did a bang-up job. Oh, look, you can... Oh, here's the... Here's the comparisons. There's a little person for comparison there. <laughs> Only 160 meters. Oh, boy. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy I'm not going to be fighting anymore. Or giants. That's the one thing that's good about being done with Mass Effect. I'd rather fight creatures my own size. Thank you very much. Oh, here's more of the destroyer there. Gosh, how long do you think it took to design this model? Look at all the little details on it. Really can appreciate everything a lot more now that I'm looking through the book here. All right, locations, Earth. Earth was an exciting level to design for Mass Effect 3. 
well, this doesn't look much like Earth, <laughs> because it marks the first time in the trilogy that Shepard visits the planet. We knew we wanted a beautiful harbor setting and kicked around many ideas for the city, including Rio de Janeiro and Hong Kong. In the end, we stayed closer to home, choosing Vancouver. Oh, hey, I'm actually going to be going there in a few weeks. These concepts show the process of designing an iconic look that wouldn't conflict with the alien architecture and was already in place. We blended large curves with strong 45 degree angles and added a slightly weathered look with human signage to make it familiar. What? <laughs> the earth I remember was London and it was blown to bits. It didn't look anything like Vancouver. <laughs> Okay, so we've got some more destruction here. I guess they're talking about at the beginning of the game when everything's getting smashed to bits, huh? Not the end. I'm I'm still stuck on the ending. All right, that's our Normandy there. Gosh, I love this art. It's so pretty. All right, got the Norman. It looks like the Normandy is docking. All these huge buildings. It's staggering the size of the whole, like all the areas of Mass Effect. It really is. All right, locations Mars. After Earth, Mars was probably the second most exciting planet to design. Really? Those were. I think they were just saying what was exciting based on what they already did. And I feel like since these were the earliest things they did, <laughs> I don't see how Mars was the second most exciting, but whatever. We knew it would have human architecture, and we wanted to capture the realistic f feel of a drill site on the red planet excavating Prothean secrets of. The Mars archive. We kept the base quite low to the ground to help it survive sandstorms and other harsh Martian weather, and went with a circular design that supported a large drilling shaft down the middle. The large spokes coming off the circle serve as docking stations for shuttles and rovers. Ooh. Okay, fair enough. I guess a lot of thought did go into the design of Mars, and it is really, I mean, it is cool. I'm not, I'm not going to say that it isn't, but of all the places that they designed, that was the most exciting. Now, see, I would have imagined it would be Thessia or something like that. Uh, there, okay, there's the concept, and here it is. Well, it's still art, but a little bit more colorful. Very pretty. Oh, wow. You got ships over there in the top. This is mess. Oh yeah, you can really. My gosh, the look at all of the details here. You'd almost think they took a photograph. Wow. Okay, okay. I see why it's exciting. It's exciting because they put a lot of thought into it. That's why it's exciting. All right. Ah, Sir Kesh. Sir Kesh, the Solarian homeworld, had a harbor. Oh, had to harbor an amphibious species. We went in with a lush, tropical jungle that implied humidity. We thought the large curves of the structures mimicked some of the more organic shapes in the Solarian armor and clothing. The actual inspiration for this building was a shopping center in Istanbul. Oh, wow! We intentionally designed the interiors to blur the line between the landscape and the structure, which helped give the base a very open and inviting feeling. The rubble is a result of Cerberus dropping in a commando team, turning the idyllic building into a battleground. Yeah, Sir Kesh, man, that was like super duper early on. And you know, Sir Kesh, I, I, not, I think this is about how I expected, you know, the Solarian homeworld to look. You know, really jungly and really humid. You know, I feel like the Solarians. You know, maybe it was just because I didn't have Morden through my playthrough. Playthrough, but it felt like the Solarians kind of took a a back seat to a lot of what was going on. It, it seemed like the Asari, the Krogan, the Quarians, all of their ordeals felt a lot more important than uh, anything any you know the Solarians were up to outside of 
you know, the genophage anyway. I guess it's just that they're, I feel like the Salarian story was so mixed in to the Krogans that they didn't really build much of their own identity. All of Salarian problems were, we were just trying to uplift a Krogan, oh my gosh, genophage, oh my gosh, we talk like we're crazy, genophage, genophage, uplift, genophage, uplift, genophage, you know, it just seemed like the Salarians didn't really have a whole lot going on outside of that. I. I just, it, it, I mean, I understand that there is a lot going on, and it's, you know, we don't really have a time for, or, you know, Reapers are attacking the galaxy, we don't have time for a safari on every single planet to get to know every single culture, but, you know, they, it's like the Solarians started out pretty interesting, and they had some cool concepts for them, but they just didn't seem to be really fleshed out very well as as much as some of the others anyway. I don't know, or my, maybe it's because the Solarian stuff seemed like it was dealt with and then wasn't brought up again. I don't know. Oh, okay, so some more some more looks of the Solarian world here. Very cool looking. Ah, Tuchanka. Yeah, this looks like oh gosh, this looks like Terminator or something with all these robots stomping around. Tuchanka was well established in Mass Effect 2 as a bomb blasted planet that was mostly rubble. The above image was a very early concept showing what Reaper walkers invading the planet might look like. Oh, so those were kind of some original Reaper designs. Looks like something out of Star Wars or something. The Lost Krogan City on uh, uh, on the facing page was... Oh, okay, it's... Alright, I'm guessing they mean this right here. Uh, the lost Krogan city on the facing page was meant to evoke the feeling that the Krogan were worth saving and that they once created things of beauty before their society crumbled and the Krogan nearly became extinct. We showed minor battle damage as well as sparse foliage to imply that life had a small fragile hope of persisting even in the midst of mass destruction. Oh yes, you can see how there's just a little bit of grass and one sad little tree by this stream here amongst the ruins of what was probably once a gorgeous building and you see like some temple type stuff in the background, this building back here. And you know, you, you learn from Eve, or what's her, what's her real name, Bakara, or whatever, the female Krogan, you know, you learn so much from her, and you realize that the Krogans are, the Krogan are a lot more than just, you know, soldiers and fighters, and you know, they're not simple, but that they're people, just like anyone else. You, you try to apply, you know, uh, a category, or you know, you try to apply some attributes to this race. Oh, they're, you know, just fighters. They have no culture. They're just, you know, they're, they're our, our, our uh, cannon fodder. There's, there's the word I'm looking for, you know, and you look at this and you realize that there's more to them. They're more than just cannon fodder. They, you even meet with a Krogan poet at some place along the game, you know? It's like, yeah, the majority of them might be fighters, but there's more to them than that. But yeah, looking around Tuchanka, even in Mass Effect 2 with all the missions and stuff, it is, it's just really depressing seeing all the ruin and destruction. But then in Mass Effect 3, when you go through the temple or whatever, right before you fight the Reaper, you can see that, yeah, the Krogan at one point could create something beautiful. And, you know, someday, now that the genophage is cured and, you know, poor Rex's quads recover, they'll be back to building something beautiful once again. I feel like uh, of of all of the what-ifs after the game ends, the Krogan one seems to be the most solid. It's like, okay, you know they're gonna sit here and make babies like crazy and hopefully life will be pretty okay for them and hopefully they won't overpopulate and hopefully they'll settle on a planet that doesn't belong to, that they don't have to share with anyone else. I don't know. Alright, moving on here. Oh! Alright, that's colorful. <laughs> More of Tuchanka. All the destruction. 
All right, Rannoch. The challenge for Rannoch, the Quarian homeworld, was to create a place that seemed consistent with two alien styles, Quarian ar architecture seen on the migrant fleet and Geth architecture introduced by the Geth occupation of the Quarian planet centuries prior. We decided to keep Rannoch's Quarian environments industrial looking with modular stainless steel sections similar to the Lloyds of London building. The interiors and exteriors were meant to blend. There was no hard line between the two. Oh man, I it was really like, it was very exciting to go to Rannoch because you hear Tally talking about this place, you know, for a significant portion of the game, hearing about how they lost their world. And, you know, the Quarians pick a really piss poor time to retake their home world right in the middle of the whole, you know, Reaper thing going on. You know, I, I, I could be pretty miffed at them for that. But, you know, in the end, I'm really happy because the Quarians and the Geth kissed and hugged and made up and now the geth can help you know that little ending screen where you get to see an unmasked quarian and a geth helping her out that made that alone made made this struggle worth but i finally got to see an unmasked quarian woo but um you know it, it does it puts a smile on my face to know that um you know as far as synthetic life goes it doesn't have to be destroyed it you know, it, it could, it's capable of finding peace, and we made peace, and hopefully peace can continue as long as everyone can understand one another. So, you know, I'm really glad that uh, everything turned out the way it did on uh, Rannoch. I would have been pretty darn disappointed if it ended up any other way. All right, Thessia! In previous games, players visited Asari-influenced worlds, so we knew how to style the Asari homeworld for Mass Effect 3. The architecture has a lot of large swooping curves, reminiscent of the, wor of the work of architect Santiago Calatrava. Wow, the designers of this game really knew their stuff. I have no idea who that is. I'll have to look that up. The above image is an early concept for Thessia that did not show the battle damage from a Reaper invasion that eventually made it into Mass Effect 3. The concept on the facing page is, the, is for the Asari Temple on Thessia, which includes upward swooping lines like a cathedral. The lower images show some of the battle damage added to the planet to tie it to the Reaper attack. Alright, so here's our temple. That was one of the coolest moments in the game. Going to the Thessia temple with Javik and learning that the Protheans basically intervened in the in, in Asari uh, history and basically made the Asari what they are. So it's definitely understandable that, uh, you know, the Protheans were romanticized, especially when you know that. And this was a huge secret kept by all of the Asari that knew it, which is just staggering to think about. Oh, okay. Well, you know, the only problem I have, I don't know why it goes to the Citadel there, you know, the only problem I really had with all of these really cool areas in the game was you really didn't get to explore them much. Thessia, you got to go there, but, you know, you're on rails the whole time. Rannoch, you get to go there, but you're on rails, you know, and that's something they did in um, Dragon Age 2. You get to go to these cool places, but you're very limited where you get to go. And it's such a shame because in Mass Effect 1, you had a bit more free roam of the different planets, you know, especially like when you're just exploring different planets. Now, to be fair, a lot of the planets did reuse a lot of the models and the area wasn't particularly big, but you know, the first Mass Effect felt so much bigger than the other two, which is kind of a step backwards, but they felt bigger because you had free roam and you didn't always necessarily know where to go. You had to wander around a little bit sometimes, and I think a perfect Mass Effect game would have had a slightly more open galaxy. Now, I'm not sure how something like, um, you know, Fallout or Skyrim would work where you, or uh, I don't know why I call it Skyrim Elder Scrolls. I'm not sure how something like that would work where you have complete open, uh, 
a complete open world and you know a lot of places to go roaming I feel like too much open world would probably get repetitive and you'd probably get lost a lot and they could only make it so big without it being just daunting right but it would have been better you know it's like they put so much love oops they put so much love and effort into all of these worlds you see how excited they were to create them and then you barely really get to explore them much that's really one of my biggest complaints is you don't there's not really a whole lot of exploring I wish that the last two games had felt maybe a bit more like Mass Effect in terms of just this massive gal having this massive galaxy to get lost in but it's also understandable that you're kind of on a time limit it's like okay the Reapers are coming do you really need to be exploring this planet right now Shepard mm, I guess not you know but I don't know it's they put so much effort into making all these cool worlds and like I said you just don't really get to see them in, outside the battles that you do you don't even really get to you know revisit and see it check up on everyone it would have been great to be able to go back to Rannoch you know a couple weeks or a couple months after the peace and see how things are going it would have been a much better game I think not that it to say that Mass Effect was a bad game but I just think maybe a little bit more open worldness would have been a lot of fun all right now the Citadel we had seen the Citadel in the previous two games, but we needed a few more concepts to show the, uh, the station from a new angle in Mass Effect 3. The image on the facing page is a concept for the Keeper tunnels that were never used, where the creatures would walk around to maintain the station. The blue pads used Mass Effect fields to keep the outer skin of the ward arm separate from the rest of the structure so it could shrug off incredible impacts during a battle. Ah, so here's those keeper tunnels then, huh? Okay, old version, Citadel revision, okay, here you go. No, uh, no slides forward and flush with main panel. Oh wow, they actually like figured out how it was going to move. Triangular piece slides back. Add layers for more detail and thickness, old version. Oh, that's so cool, seeing all the, w all the thought that went into this. So much goes into making a game, it's staggering. Okay, so now let me talk about the Citadel. I wish there were better pictures of it, but um, the Citadel in uh, Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3, I'd, I'd say they kind of sucked, honestly. Like, using an elevator to go back and forth everywhere kind of brings me back to my uh, point that I made on the planets. You feel so on rails, like there's not really... Yeah, there's a lot of places to go on the Citadel, but nowhere you can really get lost. You don't feel like you're just lost wandering around. And the first Mass Effect... You know, it really drives home how important the Citadel is. The, fir the first thing you do after your first mission in Mass Effect 1 is you go to the Citadel. And I spent so long in there wandering around, getting lost. Like, it, it, it was overwhelming. It was. It felt almost... It felt daunting to go through the first Citadel because there was so much going on on there and you know it's really a shame that they went from this fully connected citadel where you could access different parts through the elevator through stairs you could you know walk everywhere in the citadel to this on rails place with a few you know different places you could go now the citadel dlc was really awesome and showed a more fun side of the citadel i just wish that all of it had been connected instead of having to take a car or using an elevator to go everywhere i think they Real, I honestly feel like they really screwed up the Citadel. I mean, it was cool that there were fun things to do. I loved, you know, getting, I loved all the random conversations, the random quests. I really did. It was cool getting to learn more about the galaxy from the Citadel, but like I said, it just really sucked that they took away that feeling of grandeur, you know, when you, compared to when you, like when you step into the Citadel the first time in, ever in the first game, it's like, holy moly this is amazing and then when you step into the second one okay well this is cool I miss getting to wander around and you know the third third game had that same feeling of well this is cool but I liked wandering around so um 
I really, really do feel like the, the Citadel kind of took a step backward. And, um, you know, it was really cool to find out that the Citadel was, you know, a very key component to everything. It was one of the most important things in the whole galaxy in regards to the Reaper. It, it was really cool. I think the whole, the whole, like, history and plan for the Citadel was really cool, which makes it even more of a shame that you couldn't explore it in a more open way. All right, Manet. The top image is an early concept of a Turian outpost created when we were trying to get a handle on their design. We knew what their ships looked like, but not their architecture. The two images, or the below two images, were made at, uh, made after it was decided that the Turians would have a base on Manet, Palavin's moon, from which they would uh, could organize a counter attack on the Reapers. The Turian structures were designed to be a portable or were designed to be portable military fortifications that could be set up hastily. All right, you know, that makes sense. Ooh, interesting. Turians are, you know, they drive it into your skull that they are the elite fighting force. They don't, you know, they're not as big as the Krogan, so they're not just brute fighters. They they employ strategy, technology. You, you're going to have a hard time bringing down a Turian force. And I think that's something that's definitely well established. All right, the Cerberus Headquarters. These are early concepts imagining the Cerberus Headquarters. The top image represents a version in which the elusive man over on the left is not viewing a hologram, but instead has a window that looks out at a dying star. The image on the facing page envisions what the room would look like following a violent confrontation. Oh gee, yeah, that's what it looks like following a violent confrontation indeed. That's what it looks like after Kyling and Shepard tear each other apart in there. I guess they had a concept for what the final battle was going to be a long, long time ago. And it, it was pretty, it was pretty, well, it wasn't a final battle, but it was pretty darn satisfying to kick Kai Ling upside his stupid head, especially at the end with my little renegade interrupt where I smashed through him with my Omni tool. Felt great, but I was really annoyed that uh, Shepard turned her back on him and started diddling around on the elusive man's terminal before, you know, making sure that Kyling's head was severed from his body. That would be the first, second, third, and fourth thing I would do before sitting down anywhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, the this is was one of the most iconic like looks right after and mass effect 2 after you finished a mission you would get to see a little image of the elusive man and this star in the background so very fitting to have a battle in there all right this is what the final room might have looked like if shepherd fought him in this space the concept is meant to show the moment right before the confrontation, during which Shepard is walking past the bodies of the last of the elusive man's Cerberus troops. And what a bloodbath it is. These look like um, husks right here, too. Gee, and look at this guy. He's not doing too well. Well, that's what happens when you mess with Shepard. Oh, wee. It is a real bloodbath in here. Look at this. Oh, jeez. I bet this was fun. All the details. I bet this was fun to draw, but I bet it took forever. My, my, my. All right, locations, the Normandy SR2. The Normandy SR2 did not undergo many changes from Mass Effect 2. Most notably, its colors were repainted in the Alliance blue to reflect the system's, uh, a system alliance's possession of the ship following the events of Mass Effect 2's downloadable content arrival. Yeah, it was pretty cool to get my same Normandy back. I I was really happy with it that it didn't really change all that much. I liked that it stayed mostly the same. I um, still got lost in it though, but you know, it was. It, I definitely liked the Normandy's design. It was 
you know, even though I complain about, you know, oh, you, everything's got elevators, I felt like the Normandy, it still felt like I could go ev most everywhere on the ship, even though it still had that kind of on-rails feeling. It didn't feel as bad as it did in some of the other areas. I felt like I had pretty full control over going wherever I wanted in the Normandy. So no real complaints over that. I was pretty happy with it. It was fun getting to talk to all my friends after every single mission and all the shenanigans in, in the Normandy. I loved, it, I loved Shepard's personal quarters with, you know, music and aquarium. You know, they, they did a pretty good job of adding a lot of fun touches to it. Okay, and of course the uh, Citadel DLC when the, the Normandy gets stolen is also a lot of fun too. It's uh, really crazy to think about how much Cerberus tech had to be removed though. Alright, vehicles. The human ships in the original Mass Effect had red and white detailing. The produc as production progressed on Mass Effect 3, we decided that Alliance colors should be blue and white. These ships were to be featured heavily in the final battle scenes. Oh boy, I'm just glad I didn't have to drive any, sh any like ships or vehicles in this game. You know, the first game, you had the Mako, and holy moly, did I end up upside down a three quarters of the time in that damn thing. I hated the Mako because I just couldn't drive it very well. But I would still take 50 Mako Makos over the hammerhead. That thing sucked too, so glad they uh, had me on foot for the most part in the third game. Uh, more vehicles here. The shuttle, of course. I got real used to being inside that shuttle there. Alright, weaponry. We created the Omni Blade to make melee combat as exciting as gunplay. The blade is similar to the Omni Tool uh, from the previous games, but it is not entirely holographic. In Mass Effect 3, the Omni Tool uses an ultra-fast fabricator to manufacture a disposable blade almost instantly. Yeah, it's what uh, Shepard did to Kai Ling. Now, um... I, you know, I, I think I punched a banshee in the head once, but <laughs> I didn't really use a whole lot of melee, which might have been better for me seeing as I can't aim, but, um, you know, I, uh, I can't imagine it's, ex it's as exciting as gunplay. I mean, maybe it is. I'll have to try a melee playthrough. I didn't really use it a whole lot, but I could definitely see how it's really fun that you, when you, especially when you don't have to aim, right? Alright, uh, more of the weapons. Alright, okay, well let's look at the weapons, I guess, for a second. Okay, so the weapons were interesting. I originally stayed away from Mass Effect because I don't like shooters. I can't aim, and uh, you guys that watched my playthrough know I cannot aim. But uh, when you start playing through Mass Effect, you realize it's not really all about shooting. It's not a, a shooter game. Well, originally, the first game anyway. It, it wasn't really a shooter game. It wasn't really intended to be, and uh, for that reason, I'm very glad that I made an engine because it, it felt kind of more like, um, you know, it just felt like a futuristic RPG. Instead of casting fireballs, I was launching incinerates, you know, instead of casting frost bolts, I'm using uh, the cryo freeze, right? Uh, they're, they're, the abilities really made it a lot more fun for people like me who aren't so great on the, at the whole shooting thing. <laughs> but um, I'm pretty happy with what I used. I liked using a pistol. You know, I feel like if you know, I like to get really immersed in games, and I feel like if I were Shepard and I were out there, I'd probably carry something lightweight, like a pistol, something I can manage, right? I, I wouldn't be carrying around any of these heavy monstrosities here. And, you know, I played around with the sniper rifle for a little bit. It, it was fun in Mass Effect 3 that I could use any of the weapons instead of being limited. I really liked that, and um, I, I did try out a few things, like in the arena, I tried out a sniper rifle, but you just really couldn't go wrong with a good pistol. I really liked the I liked a good pistol and you know a good submachine gun. I really liked the weapons. I'm bad at sniping. Shotguns probably aren't bad for me. Now the wet the weapons seem to go like kind of backwards though. It's like I don't really remember using ammo in the first game. I'm pretty sure there wasn't ammo. You just shot, and uh, I think that was even addressed in the game because you never really pick up 
bullets, you pick up thermal clips in the second and third. So you're like trying to prevent your gun. It just seemed like a step backward in that regard. And it seemed kind of strange from going from not needing ammo to needing ammo. Not that I ever really like, honestly, it seemed kind of weird because I never really ran out of ammo, but you know, a couple of times and I just ran forward and grabbed a few anyway. So the whole introduction to ammo felt kind of pointless. Now, I don't know if maybe on higher difficulties, like Insane or whatever, if running out of ammo is a real, uh, a real issue or not, but I never ran into the issue of running out of man or mana ammo, um, so it just felt like kind of a, kind of felt pointless, honestly. It seemed like a mechanic that you just really didn't need to add, and in a lot of ways it felt like a step backward, because it, 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 I think the idea wasn't really necessarily to be a shooting game, as it was just to be a futuristic RPG with fun abilities and stuff, but whatever. All right, so the Crucible. The Crucible is meant to evoke an enormous rocket-propelled bomb, something like a cross between the Trinity bomb and a NASA space probe. Yeah, so they threw this Crucible together in what felt like a pretty, pretty fast amount of time. You'd think something like this would take, you know, 30, 40 years or something to create. But, you know, the thing with technology is it's always getting better and better, and they managed to slap this together in just a few months, so good job. <laughs> oh, yeah, seeing that drift around in space, I had no idea how big it was. It would have been cool to uh, go check on it periodically and see how, like, see it being built, actually see it being built more often. All right, uh, I guess that was the end of the art book there. Um, oh, okay, I guess there's a, oh, okay, I guess the art from the whole universe. Okay, well, heck, I kind of want to get that. <laughs> well, guys, that was the art book there. I'm a little disappointed. I thought that it would uh, talk about every single character, and it didn't. It only talked about a few of the, you know, more, I guess, prominent characters. You know, they didn't talk about uh, Tally or the Krogan or anything, and this video is already close to half an hour, and I still haven't even finished all of my thoughts on the characters, so, um, you know, I, mm, I guess, you know, and I'll, 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 I'll wrap up things right about here, so I'm not going to talk about the endings of Mass Effect at all, I'm just going to save that for another video entirely, honestly, um, because there's a lot to talk about in regards to the ending of Mass Effect, and like I said, that alone, I just need a video on that, but Mass Effect as a whole, you know, really was a good game, regardless of, you know, the ending, you love it, you hate it, whatever. I I have my own thoughts on the ending, of course, but my, you know, the ending didn't take away from any of these amazing experiences throughout the whole game. You know, there's a lot of themes overall, there's a lot of good life lessons to be learned, and, you know, all of those interesting aspects of Mass Effect Effect aren't diminished or even taken away by the last 20 minutes of it. It was still a remarkable journey. It really was. After the game ended, I seriously did not sleep well for two or three nights. I'm still having some issues over the game being finished. I need a shrink. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's definitely an experience and it's left me just thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking about all of it and it's just been such a wonderful ride. I mean, there's things that I liked and disliked about every single entry to the game. You know, the first game I loved stepping into a new you know, universe, right? A whole new story to get lost into. You know, the open world feel, the, the grandeur of the Citadel, finding out about the Reapers. Talking to a Reaper for the first time was just mind-blowing. I actually remember that very well because I lost my initial recording when you talk to a Reaper in the very first game. I had to re-record that part of the game. And uh, it was actually pretty good because so much happened that I actually wanted to experience it again anyway. 
but um, you know, nothing will ever topple the feeling of the first game and stepping into the world and realizing how crazy everything is. The second game, you know, felt like just a bridge between the two as trilogies tend to go. You know, um, it felt like the second game though, you were just running around making friends and um, it didn't feel like there was really as much urgency as the first or even the third games. It, it, it honestly just felt like adventures and fun with Shepard for the most part. Not, I'm not trying to say the second was a bad game, don't misunderstand me here. In fact, um, you know, I almost think it was, it was more important than I, I, I even realized until I talked it out with, um, with a friend. Because my thought is, the very first game, you're experiencing it as Shepard the Human. And the second game, you're experiencing it as Shepard the Half-Synthetic. Because uh, at the end of Mass Effect 3, the uh, boy catalyst thing at the end even mentions, hey, you're half-synthetic. And that's something to keep in mind, because that's something that's pretty important, is this tension between synthetics and humans. And Shepard happens to be this perfect blend of, you know, technology. I'm not saying she's synthetic life, but she, she's definitely got a lot of technology in installed on her. But Shepard's this mix between um, synthetics and humans, or humans, organics, whatever. So you've got this blend of organic life, and now maybe it's not really synthetic life, but Shepard is a blend. And I think that's what the second game's big important takeaway is that this is life as Shepard the synthetic. And it, like, it didn't really touch on a whole lot, like, it, it did feel like there was a lot of just running around making friends. And it really sucked because a lot of those friends that you make, um, Jack, end up largely absent through a lot of Mass Effect 3. And it's really like, you sure you don't want to come with me? You sure you, you don't got anything better to do? So it was kind of a bummer to not have them along for the ride in Mass Effect 3 after going and doing all of these personal quests for them. It almost feels like, well, wasn't there something better I could have been doing? <laughs> no, I mean, I still enjoyed Mass Effect 2, but I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. I'm just a little disappointed in it that it went from fun time with friends to, okay, let's get back to Reapers. I feel like Mass Effect 2 could have been maybe its own story, or maybe there could have been more adventures with Shepard. I don't know. It just seemed like Mass Effect 2 fit in kind of strangely to me. And then, of course, Mass Effect 3. Okay, so other than the ending, we're not going to talk about the ending. That's a whole other story. I understand that. But you know, prior to the ending, the cool thing about Mass Effect 3 is all of the what-ifs. What if Morden had lived? What if I had shot Rex back in Mass Effect 1 on Vermeer? What if, you know, I had never awoken Grunt? You know, what if I hadn't saved the Rachni Queen? What if I hadn't given the elusive man the collector base? And, you know, maybe maybe the changes really aren't that different, you know? Maybe that you just get all, you know, like I got Paddock w Wilkes or Wicks or whatever his name is for uh, the, re the not Morden, <laughs> for my replacement character for where Morden was probably going to be, right? So it's like, you know, maybe the what-ifs aren't that big, but it's not about what the what-ifs actually are, it's about a man imagining the what-ifs. It just make that's the biggest fun in playing these. What had happened if I picked the other choice? What had happened if this I'd done this instead? And that's the really fun thing about Mass Effect 3 is imagining the what-ifs. Even the only real problem is a lot of the what-ifs don't really change a lot of the big decisions. You know, you have really one big decision to make at the end and that's your ending, which you know, like I said, I'm going to talk about those in a separate video, but, you know, there were great things about each Mass Effect, and there were things that could have been done better, but overall it was an absolutely magical journey with a lot of really great lessons and a lot of great themes, and, 
you know, I regret that I waited so long to play this because I'm a huge fan of Dragon Age. I love Dragon Age, but, you know, I shied away from this because I thought it was a shooter and I don't like shooting games. But, uh, oh boy, you know, maybe, maybe, I w maybe it's a good thing that I waited because I got to share this wonderful experience with all of you. I loved reading all of your comments after I was done playing the trilogy. I've loved hearing everyone's thoughts and interpretations of everything. Like, I had one idea about the ending that I got, and then, you know, reading your comments, I was like, oh, okay, and then I had another idea, and then I've read about the indoctrination theory. It's, it's so fun to talk about games with gamers, and like I said, playing this game with you guys has made it the, one of the just the most wonderful wonderful experiences in gaming I've ever had and it's been a real pleasure sharing my thoughts with you all as we look through the book here. So I'm going to do another video pretty soon on uh, the endings because I feel like the endings of Mass Effect really do, or Mass Effect 3, really do deserve their own video so that I can talk about how I feel about them and, you know, my gripes, my complaints, but also what I liked about them and my own thoughts about them. So that will be coming up pretty soon. Thank you guys so much for sharing this experience with me. I would love to know your thoughts on the Mass Effect trilogy. You know, if you agree, disagree, or, you know, something else entirely, I'd love it if you left them in the comments so that I can read them. It's always so fun to, you know, listen or to talk games with gamers. So, all right, guys. Well, I'll see you in Andromeda, and I hopefully I'll see you in my little discussion about the endings. Thank you guys uh, for watching today and bye for now.